Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Why well, I'm here, one of my writers this case, Kevin, has written me a script, Phil Spector, music producer and murderer. Holy shit. Like, Phil Spector is a famous name. I'm not sure if that's because he murdered someone or whether he was, he was a music producer. But he was pretty famous, right? He's famous outside of just being just being a murderer. It's also fairly intense, though. It's like, whenever a famous person becomes a murderer, you're like, oh my god, why? Why would you do that? You had so much going for you. Uh, if you're new here, the form of the show is I've never read this. We're going to read it together. We're going to explore. Also, how brilliant of a name for a murderer is f***ing Spectre. It's like he's the Spectre of Death. Okay, here we go. There's a lot of discussion revolving around the link between narcissism and self-esteem, since narcissists are generally defined as being arrogant, entitled, and having an inflated sense of self-importance. On the surface, it would seem that these individuals would have higher self-esteem. However, the link between most forms of narcissism and high self-esteem is fairly small. Yeah, I understand that. I'm a bit narcissistic, for sure. But also, I don't know. I just guess I've got a little bit of narcissism and I've got a little bit of self-esteem. That sounds fine. People with a stable sense of high self-esteem know in their very core how awesome they are. While there is a chance that it manifests itself through narcissism, it's more than likely just to improve their interactions with other people, especially in a work setting. Really? So high self-esteem is more likely to improve your... Oh, I suppose so. If you think you're good at stuff, then you go around being like, I'm good at stuff. And people are like, let's trust that guy. So let me interrupt today's video to tell you about our fantastic sponsor today, which is My Heritage. It will take you through an incredible journey and discover your family history. Look, understanding where you come from, it is an amazing journey. Like, I went back on my mum's side of the family, her surname, which I'm not going to tell you because it's like literally when... <laughs> When you phone up your bank or whatever, they're like, what's your mum's surname? Like, oh, okay. But I followed her name all the way back in the UK records to the 1850s in the UK. And then I was like, oh. And then they came over from, that was when they came over from Germany. Because I was like, my mum has like a, a German surname. And I'm like, well, and now we know, don't we? All the way back in 1850, which is amazing. And I went back like less generations than that to like 100 years ago and found like the house that my great grandfather lived in looked it up on google maps and i was like look that's that house and then on the other side of the family i mean it gets complicated because once you go back a few generations you're like wait what side of the family am i on i'm on my grandfather's mother's side but whatever it doesn't matter i found a picture of my great granddad when he was serving in the raf back in world war one and then i used their photo restore tool to to make his picture like way more detailed which i thought wouldn't work because it was super it was like a group photo and it was i just zoomed super in on his face and then it totally restored him i was like oh my god this dude has the same eyebrows as me which is uh well, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? I, uh, when I first got this, they sent it to me for free, which was pretty cool because, uh, and then I proceeded to get completely addicted to it. And when I was supposed to be working, I was just like, just five more minutes on my heritage. Just a few more connections. And then also, if there's someone who's connected to you, you can join like your family trees together and then you can see all of their research as well. So, and then like how your families are joined and then it's like you're related as well. And they're like your seventh cousin or whatever. However, that works. It's, it's really cool. And you find out all these relatives and things about them. Like you find out their jobs from like census reports and stuff. It's really cool. And I'm totally off the talking points because this is a sponsor that I just find really, really compelling. My Heritage has over 19 billion historical records that you can dig through and find out stuff about your own family. It is pretty amazing. They've also got something called Instant Discoveries, which provides instant discoveries. It's right there in the name. It's all based on solid research. You can trust the information that you find. So what you need to do is you can get a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features that MyHeritage has to offer. And if you decide to continue your subscription, you'll even get a 50% discount, which is nice, isn't it? Just click the link in the description box below or the pinned comment. Thank you to my heritage for sponsoring, and now back to today's video. These people tend to handle negative feedback and constructive criticism well because deep down they know they're awesome, they just made a mistake or did something that could be improved upon. <laughs> Tell you what, YouTube's good for developing this because you're like, at first you see the neg like a negative comment, you're like, oh no, oh no, one person on the internet thinks I'm sh and then what you do is you, as you make more stuff and you become more popular, you're like, oh my god, there's a lot of people who think I'm sh you very quickly like, yeah, whatever. You know what? The vast majority, like you, you know, I always come for myself because you just go into the studio. And you're like, YouTube Studio, it's like the back end where you see all the analytics and stuff. And it's like 99% like ratio, baby. And so that's good. Like if 99% of people like your shit, I mean, that's still going to be like a thousand, a uh, 1% who don't. Which if you've done a video that's, um, let's say, got a million views, that's still going to be a thousand people who really didn't like it. A thousand people? 10,000 people? 
10,000 people who really did like it. Oh my lord. But when it comes to fragile high self-esteem, it's a completely different story for these people. Their sense of self-worth is dependent on external validation and lying to themselves rather than being something more innate. They often come across as introverted, anxious, and insecure. These individuals seek constant validation and recognition as any form of negative feedback risks damaging their illusions of themselves. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I've known people like this. And it's not like, it's not the most attractive quality. <laughs> quality? Trait. It's not the most attractive trait. Unlike stable self-esteem, fragile self-esteem is a very high correlation with vulnerable narcissism. Vulnerable narcissists have the same feelings of superiority to others, but they're extremely self-conscious and hypersensitive to rejection. Though normally not as violently dangerous as malignant narcissists, vulnerable narcissists tend to be extremely controlling perfectionists. They have high levels of aggressive and abusive behaviors and can be extremely manipulative to achieve their goals of perfect perfection. They feel they need to be, because if anything they do is perceived as less than perfect, it risks shattering their fragile psyche and send them spiraling into depression. Oh my god. <laughs> it's just schooling me on narcissism. I was like, yeah, narcissism. People who think they're awesome. Turns out it's extremely complicated. Which, I mean, it always is. Like, the human brain's very, like, very complex. It's always like, yeah, I think I know what's going on with myself and my brain. It's like, you got no idea, fact boy. You got no idea. On a day-to-day -day basis, it's the sort of personality that would make a celebrity yell, don't you know who I am, at the faintest perceived slight in order to immediately be placated with praise and approval to quickly repair the damage to their ego. But isn't the risk that the person's like, no, I don't know who you are. Stop it. That's really uncomfortable. And then that would be even more damaging to your ego. Like, I'd never, ever... Even if I was Tom Cruise, you'd never do that because you'd be like, well, one, it makes you look like an absolute tosser. And two, what if they're like, I don't know who you are. I've never seen any of your movies, Tom. <laughs> I mean, or like nameless short stranger. I don't know how to throw in that short joke there. I love Tom Cruise. He's a legend. <laughs> Other than his like unusual religious beliefs. <laughs> it's me, Tom Cruise. Yeah, I know who you are. But in the most extreme cases, when abuse and threats don't get the person what they want, it's the type of personality that can quickly turn violent. It's also the type of personality that might cause a person to yell at the police responding to a 911 call that they work for him and that he's friends with the mayor. After being... <laughs> <laughs> I remember, like, after university, like, it's like, okay, the police work for him because it's like he pays taxes or whatever. <laughs> there was a mate of mine who, after university, went to work for a, a bank called RBS. And just as, I think it was just after he went to work there or something, there was the financial crisis. And RBS was, like, acquired by the government, by the British taxpayer. And it was like, I don't know. It was, it was like the vast majority of it was just owned by the government. <laughs> we make fun that he worked for us. <laughs> and he's a civil servant. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it was funny, but he never found it funny. I'm like, it's funny, man. Come on. Come on. You work for us, so you should laugh at our jokes. <laughs> After being taken into custody that same night, such a person's first statement to interrogators might be, she's a piece of shit, and I don't know what her f problem was, but she certainly had no right to come to my f castle, blow her head open, and say that I murdered her. What the f is wrong with you people? And say that I murdered her? No one's saying that. They've been murdered. They're dead. The Barbarian Queen Lana Clarkson was born on April the 5th, 1962 in Long Beach, California, before her family moved to Sonoma County in Northern California. I know we don't say this much on this channel, but Lana had a happy and normal childhood. She even got her own house for her 10th birthday. Oh, horse. Sorry, horse. <laughs> so she got a house for her 10th birthday? Holy sh**. She got a horse for her 10th birthday, which she loved riding, which is still kind of, that, that's still impressive. Like, I'm not buying my, I don't want my kids to become horsey kids. Like, I know, I've known some like horsey people and they're like really into horses. And for me, as the parents, I'm like, well, one, it's dangerous. Like, riding horses is dangerous. And second, I find it very boring. Like, I'm, I'm not even into horses racing, let alone the other, like, dressage and shit and horse jumping. I'm like, I cannot imagine anything more tedious. And if my kid's into that, then it's the sort of stuff you have to go to on the weekend, where there's smelly horses. And you have to be like, oh my god, that's amazing. Well done. I'm so impressed with your horsey skills. And if in like 20 years, my kid listens to this and it turns out they did, did grow up to be like a horsey person, they're going to be like, dad, were you faking it for all of those years about how much you loved my horsey ways? And I'll be like, yes, my dear, I was faking it this whole time because horses are boring. And she'd be like, yeah, but what about Sprinkles? He's not boring. And I'll be like, he is boring. He's very boring. Horses are boring. I'm sorry. Wow, that was a tangent, wasn't it? Just about horses. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not buying my kid's horses. I've even encouraged my wife, don't get them into horsey shit. 
and she likes horses. So I'm like, no, no horse riding. But part of a normal childhood for kids in California is dreaming of becoming a famous entertainer. That was a, <laughs> I, I, like, I, I used to, this is like my dream as a kid. Now look at me. <laughs> That's a pretty normal dream, regardless of where people are from, yes. But it seems much more realistic when you're living in the same place that a lot of famous celebrities live and work. I bet it is. For me, I was like, that is never going to happen. What are the odds of that? So then I went on to have like, okay, I should just do a serious career. Like I should, I, I went to university to study business and then I studied law and you're like, yeah, 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 you know, this kind of stuff. And now I do what I actually wanted to do, which is crazy to me. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. But I bet if you if you do grow up in places like this, you just see celebrities around and about and you're like, yeah, of course, it's a normal career path. Everyone can do this. And so for me, it's like, I didn't know anyone famous. <laughs> Not at all. I don't think I've only met famous people since becoming like a YouTuber. And they've all just been other YouTubers. Have I met anyone famous who's not a YouTuber? I genuinely don't think so. I don't think so. I really don't think so. <laughs> Fun. The family moved back to Los Angeles County when Lana was 16, and she began to actively pursue a career in the entertainment industry. She landed her first role in 1982 in the film Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I've heard of that, I've not seen it, but I've heard of it, as Mrs. Vargas, a role that allegedly wasn't in the script. According to the story, Lana was just hired to play an extra for the prom scene in the movie. She was 18 at the time of filming, so that certainly makes sense. Vincent Chiavelli decided before they started filming the scene that it would be funny to do the ugly guy with a hot wife trope, and selected Lana from a lineup of extras to be introduced as his beautiful beautiful younger wife. It was a very minor part, and she didn't even have any lines, but since she was no longer hidden in the background, it was enough to get her noticed. This brief appearance was enough to get the beautiful six-foot-tall Lana a number of appearances on some of the most popular television shows of the 1980s, like Three's Company, The Jeffersons, Who's the Boss, and Night Court. I've only heard of Three's Company from those. Uh, never seen it, of course, never seen any of them. She never played a recurring character on any of these shows, but she began developing a loyal fan base. After that brief appearance in Fast Times, her modeling career began to take off as well. Despite never working for any major designers, Lana's work as a high fashion model took her all around the world, including Japan, Argentina, and numerous countries throughout Europe. She spent so much time traveling that she even wound up learning to speak Italian and Spanish. Margarete. But as wonderful an opportunity as it was, modeling wasn't her passion. She didn't want to just be a pretty face. She wanted to be a legitimate actress. She appeared as an extra in Scarface, dancing behind Michelle Pfeiffer at the Babylon Club. It had been another major film, but it was another non-speaking role. Unfortunately, just a few months before Scarface came out, the movie with Lana's first starring role hit theaters. Oh, why is that unfortunate? I only say unfortunately because of who was behind the movie. Lana was about to learn the hard way that two of the scariest words an aspiring actress could ever hear were Roger Corman. I know Roger Corman. I mean, obviously not personally. I've read his uh, autobiography. It's brilliant. Roger Corman had a fascinating career. What's wrong with Roger Corman? <laughs> I think I have his book on my table. It's one of my... I've read it twice. When it came to men in Hollywood, especially back in the 50s and 60s, working with Corman was a great thing. He's credited with having a huge role in launching the careers of big names like Jack Nicholson, Robert De Niro, Charles Bronson, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, and James Cameron. But as for women, there was, uh, well, Sandra Bullock's career seems to have survived her encounter with Corman. Wait, what did Corman do? By the 1980s, Corman was known as the king of the B-movies, and I would conservatively estimate he was directing 40 movies each week. It wasn't quite that many. But Corman was like... He, was, he went to Hollywood, and he was just a business genius. Like, he was... It, all of the stuff he did, he was like... He didn't want to be, like, an A-movie director. He wanted to direct B-movies. And he'd direct tons of them, and then some of them would do really well, and most of them would just not do well at all. But because he did some that were really successful, he ended up being a super successful uh, director. Or producer, or whatever he was. Producer. Lana's first movie in, uh, was 1983's Deer Stalker, one of five sword and sorcery films in which she would star. These movies are generally bad, but they're low-budget and have a decent-sized cult following, so it was profitable enough for Corman to keep churning them out. Exactly. Death Stalker may have only pulled $12 million at the box office, but it only cost about $450,000 to make. Which is like... I mean, that's an amazing return. <laughs> <laughs> what did Corman do wrong? Two years later, Nana would land the titular role in Corman's Barbarian Queen, a role she would later reprise in the film's direct-to-video sequel, Barbarian Queen 2, The Empress Strikes Back. She took all of her roles very seriously, far more seriously than they deserved. She wasn't hired to be a good actress. She was hired to look hot, get naked, and mow down her enemies with a sword. That's not to say she wasn't a good actress. Corman just wasn't interested in making good movies. Why bother to create quality content when you could make millions by lazily filming some tits and blood? I... I get where Kevin's coming from, but Corman never claimed to want to be like a creative genius like Scorsese or something like that. He just wanted to make 
movies that people wanted to watch. I don't know. I had, I, I, I'm fine with that. I think it's like just a great business move in an industry that's full, filled with almost too much creativity and too much weirdness and too many people trying to make super expensive movies that probably lose time. I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of Corman. Not his work. His movies probably are not very good but I'm a fan of his business model. Lana had been able to support herself through the 80s as an actress, model, and by appearing in commercials. She even had the time to volunteer weekly with the Los Angeles AIDS charity project Angel Food, a charity that delivered meals to people who were too sick to, sh sick to shop or cook for themselves. Delivering meals may not seem like the biggest deal, but it actually says a lot about her character given the context of when this was happening. I'm also like, no, no, no offense, Kevin, but she's going into these, she's a working actress. I'm sure there are many people who would kill for the roles that she had in these B-movies and the shot at her career going from B-movie to A-movie at some point. Because, like, obviously, you want to be an actor in A-movies, not B-movies. <laughs> like, you, you want to be... Other than the money side of things, you definitely want to be in the A-movies, don't you? Unless you're Roger Corman, you'd rather be in the A-movies. Um, but she made these choices and she's making money and it's... The, she was just modeling before. This is more than modeling. It's closer to her what she wants to do than otherwise. And it's like, oh, boo-hoo, she didn't get to be an A-list actress. Yeah, like the rest of us. You're supposed to say actor, aren't you, these days? You can't say actress, which is weird. Because I'm like, I don't know. It's, the, it's not derogatory, is it? <laughs> this was at a time when the general public was so terrified of AIDS and misinformed about it that people thought you could catch the disease by standing too close to someone. It was a time period when the town I grew up in thought it was completely appropriate to have a giant banner in the center of town to inform us of our town's current AIDS population. Holy sh**, dude. Really? A banner that nobody seemed to take issue with because it stayed up there for years. Your average person at the time would simply not have been comfortable with going door to door to visit AIDS patients. Oh, and if you're wondering, the number was 14. <laughs> what the f***? That should be so private. Anyway, when Lana hit her 30s, her acting career started to slow down. She got the occasional role, but they were becoming fewer and further farther in between. Working with Corman had a huge negative impact on her ability to land acting gigs, leaving her viewed as the hot naked chick from a bunch of B-movies rather than a serious actress, despite how, she, how seriously she had taken her work. I'm sorry, but the alternative to that is not A-list acting. It's not acting at all and just being a model. Kevin seems to frame this like, oh yeah, no, because she acted in B-movies, that destroyed her career. Um, what's It's not obvious that she would have been an A-list actress if she hadn't done that, in my opinion. She'd probably just end up being a model and then her career would slow down in her 30s anyway. Because, yeah... Okay. But as I said, these fans did have a sizable cult following. At first, Lana resented these fans because they short thought they were laughing at her in her performance. I suspect that's a really common reaction from stars of B-movies, especially if they didn't understand going in that that's the kind of film they were making. She quickly realized that they weren't laughing at her, but rather at the movies and the genre as a whole. Those movies could have had the greatest cast in the world, but they would still be poorly written garbage produced for as little money as possible. After having this realization, Lana began frequenting the growing comic book convention scene where she would sign autographs for her fans. She was known for being extremely friendly, and she would always stay as long as it took to make sure that everyone who wanted to say hi and get an autograph from her had the chance to do so, instead of just abandoning the line of people at whatever time her scheduled appearance ended. She also created her own website to sell autographed photographs and DVDs as a further way to supplement her income and interact with her fans on the site's message board. Oh my god, we just jumped forward in time. For some reason, I was all thought this is going on in the 80s. And that's like DVDs and internet. But through all of this, she hadn't given up on her dream of entertaining people and being a star. I kept saying that she wanted to be a serious actress, and she did want to be taken seriously as one, but her real dream was to be a comedic actress. Most of her television appearances have been in comedies, so she had the opportunity to show off at least a little of her comedic talents, but Lana was mainly being cast as eye candy. With her 40s rapidly approaching and her final acting credit being in 2001, she decided she was going to take a different route to entertain people, stand-up comedy. Good, take it into your own hands. Lana began developing a stand-up set, but with her acting role seemingly gone for now, she needed another source of income. While she did still have convention appearances and her website, it just wasn't enough to make ends meet. In January 2003, she got a job as a hostess at the House of Blues in West Hollywood to keep herself afloat. Celebrities visited there all the time, so it could also potentially give her the chance to make important connections and help her in a new career of comedy. Though her job was just as a hostess, Lana's co-workers also jokingly referred to her as the bouncer since she was already six feet tall before putting her heels on for work. During her second month on the job, she realized she was actually going to have to perform her duties as bouncer. <laughs> 
Upon seeing a diminutive elderly looking character with long curly hair wearing sunglasses and leading a younger female companion towards the VIP area, Lana stepped in their way to stop them. Towering nearly a foot above the intruder, she said something to the effect of, Mom, you're not allowed to come in here. This section is for VIPs only. The man looked up at her and yelled, Do you know who the f I am? She was quickly informed by a co-worker that that man was Phil Spector. Oh yes, this video is about Phil Spector. <laughs> It's like, I thought it was about this woman. I'm like, oh yeah, no, it's about Phil Spector murdering. Oh God, is he going to murder her? Oh no. I don't know how I didn't realize that until now. We've got a narcissistic, obnoxious pervert who's rude to waiters. And he was indeed a very important person who needed to be taken good care of. Lana was extremely apologetic and waited on the couple diligently, comping food and making sure they had what they needed. The girl that had accompanied Phil was actually his second date of the evening, and at this point he was more than a few drinks in and allegedly had taken some pills as well. Phil's date wound up leaving, possibly because he was a completely insufferable bore and his attention turned entirely towards Lana. He kept asking her to stop working and have a drink with him, but she refused and continued doing her job. At around 2.30am, they'd finally finished closing for the night. Lana left the house of blues and began walking towards her car to finally go home. She was approached on the street again by Phil, who continued to insist that she come back to his castle for a drink. Perhaps she decided that ingratiating herself to someone as important as Phil could help her jumpstart her career. She finally relented. Security footage from the House of Blues showed Phil's chauffeur escorting Lana into his car. These were the last images taken while she was still alive. I think I killed somebody. Phil's driver, Adriano de Souza, drove to the house Phil referred to as his castle and parked outside. His plan was to wait for them to do whatever they were going to do, then drive Lana back to her car. At just after 5 a.m. on the morning of February the 3rd, 2003, Adriano heard a loud noise from inside the house. He decided to get out of the car and investigate. This dude, the chauffeur's just sitting in his car just outside for hours. Or is he on call like 24 hours a day? Oh, man. Or does he have like three chauffeurs rotating shifts? As Adriana approached the house, Phil opened the door. He was holding a gun in his hand, and there was blood splattered on the white jacket that he was wearing. From outside, Adriana could see Lana's legs, and when he moved to get a better view, he saw her slumped over in a chair, dead from a gunshot wound to the face. Oh, my lord. What just happened? Phil told his driver, I think I killed somebody, before walking back inside and closing the door. Good lord, man. You are going to prison. I'm sorry, you're going to jail. He, I mean, I guess so, because he's a murderer. Like, it's not alleged murderer. Like, you know, um, oh, what's his face? The famous guy who like, said, I, if I did it, then this is how. Oh, what's that? OJ Simpson. You know, all allegedly. Amazing legal team. I feel he should have, Phil Spector should have had this dude's legal team. Adriano immediately ran back to his car, grabbed his cell phone, and called Phil's personal assistant, Michelle Blaine. Oh, Adriano, you gotta call the police, Adriano. This wasn't because he had any intention of the three of them trying to conceal the crime. He just wanted to ask her what the address was before calling the police. Okay, don't the police know? Like, when you call the police, they're like, you're here. Like, I remember once we had a, it wasn't our, like someone crashed into our car on the road and pulled over. And you're supposed to call the police, and then they come and they, they it, which is weird. Like in the UK, it wasn't like a big crash. It was just like, oh, the side of the car got scraped up. Let's just exchange insurance information and move on. But here in Czech, it's like the police have to come, they take some photos, they talk to you, blah, blah, blah. And then it took like an hour. But my wife calls the police and she's like, yeah, we had an accident here. And, and they're like, are you outside this number house? And we just turn around and it's the number of the house. It's like, good lord, that was precise and quick. <laughs> it may seem strange for Phil's personal driver to not know his address. Oh yeah, right? <laughs> but the mansion referred to as pa per per Pyrenees Castle? Is that how you spell Pyrenees? Pyrenees Castle was hard to miss. He wouldn't have needed it, but he did find the address before calling 911 to request police. Within minutes, police swarmed the scene and prepared to take, an ar take on an armed suspect. As they were deciding on a plan of action, Phil opened the door and started walking towards them with his hands in his pockets. They demanded that he put his hands on his head, which he did, but he quickly forgot and put them back in his pockets, repeatedly telling the police that they had that they had to see, come and see that there was a dead lady inside. I can imagine that, though. I'd be like, the police would be like, put your hands on your head, and I'd be like, okay, put my hands on my head, and then they'd just be chatting to me, and I'd take my hands down, and they'd be like, hands up! And I'd be like, oh, for God's sake, it's, I was just distracted, we're having a chat. Ah! Again, police ordered Phil to place his hands on his head, uh, hands on his head, warning him that he'd be tasered if he didn't comply. Yes! 
And again, Phil did as he was told briefly before promptly forgetting again and walking to walking forward with his hands in his pockets. 50,000 volts later, police brought Phil inside where they placed him on the ground and handcuffed him. <laughs> this is what would happen to me. I'd just be like, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. Please don't tase me. Just keep reminding me to put the hands on the head. Initially, the scene looked like a suicide. There didn't appear to be any blood on Phil and the gun was on the floor next to Lana's left leg, precisely where it would have fallen if she was left-handed. She wasn't, but if she had been, that might have helped Phil's case a tiny bit. But even without knowing Lana's handedness, police immediately recognized that the crime scene wasn't adding up. One of the police made the clever decision to leave a recording device on the banister near to the incapacitated Phil while they searched the house in hopes that he might say something incriminating. On the recording, he can be heard saying, I'm sorry there's a dead woman here, but I'm sorry this happened. It was a mistake. I don't understand what the f*** you people is wrong with you. The gun went off accidentally. Yeah, don't like. <laughs> I was like saying the other day, I talk to myself all the time. I'll just be like wandering around my like office, just talking to myself. Just like if there was a recording device, people would think I'm insane. I can't. I, I said something earlier. I was just I said up the cameras, and I was just like, "Hey, and that's how we do it." Just for no reason, just aloud to myself, and I'm like, what? "That's how we do it, is it? That's how you turn on the camera whistle, boy." I don't know what's wrong with me. It would it would sound so insane. Like you know, the, the, there's that software that spies. On you through your phone or whatever and like any you know the pegasus that they you know that governments or whatever could use to spy on you <laughs> like, i'm not a terrorist so shit, i don't think there's anyone uh, but maybe i don't know whatever whoever's listening to that is gonna think i'm absolutely mental personally i think he's losing it that's not exactly a murder confession, but Phil's own words would certainly undermine his legal defense that Lana had committed suicide. They also undermined his claim from earlier in the recording that he was neither drunk nor stupid, given his difficulty in putting together a sentence. But even without Phil's vaguely incoherent words, there was plenty of other evidence to point away from Lana's death being a suicide. To start with, why was there only one phone call to 911? Adriano made a call, but Phil hadn't. You could argue that he was in a state of shock and was unable to make a phone call, but none of his behavior really supported that. It supported that he was drunk and stupid, but the only shock he seemed to have experienced came from the police taser. Next, why would Lana go to somebody else's house to commit suicide with their gun? That's a really weird thing to do, but let's just humor the idea for a moment. The gun used was a 38 Colt Cobra, a snub-nosed revolver, and there was an empty holster that fit the gun in a drawer about five feet away from where Lana was seated. When police arrived, that drawer was the only one in the entire house that was opened. How could she have possibly known that there was a gun in that drawer, and why would she even bother searching random drawers? for a gun when there were multiple on the dis on display on the walls. <laughs> Spectre's just got what? Multiple <laughs> America, what's going on? He's just got what's that? That's my gun wall. What 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 do you mean? It's just it's where I keep my guns. They're on display. Are they loaded? Yes, they're all loaded. Okay. <laughs> There's also the location where the body was found. Adriano had been able to see Lana from outside the house because she was seated in a chair in the foyer. She also had a jacket on and her purse was hung over her shoulder. After having been inside Phil's house for at least two hours, if Lana was in the foyer wearing a jacket and purse, then she was trying to leave. But maybe that's all a bit too circumstantial for you. I'd certainly argue that it's extremely suspicious and heavily points towards Phil's involvement in the shooting, but it's probably not enough to clear the bar of reasonable doubt. Luckily, there was plenty of other forensic evidence. The reason there wasn't any of Lana's blood on Phil when the police arrived is because he had since removed the white jacket he was wearing and left it in the master bedroom. That jacket definitely had blood on it, and further forensic analysis found blood inside Phil's pockets as well. There was also blood found on the banister and a doorknob, which had been left there by Phil's hand. Phil, this is the sloppiest faking a suicide ever. <laughs> You're breaking all the rules. How have you not burned that jacket? So the police come around, it's like it stinks of burning cloth. And it's like, what's that smell? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. One place the police didn't see any blood was on the gun. There also weren't any fingerprints on it either, indicating that rather than call 911, Phil was doing a terrible job attempting to clean up the scene and destroy evidence. A bathroom near the foyer contained a cloth diaper covered in Lana's blood, which had been used to wipe down the gun and most likely to remove any visible blood from Phil's body. <laughs> Phil. He mu he's drunk, right? Because this is like the sloppiest cleanup job that I've ever seen. And we've done a lot of episodes about people trying to clean up crime scenes. I, I actually believe there is a rule. Don't try and clean up a crime scene while you're drunk. Or like, uh, I think it's don't get drunk if you're cleaning up a crime scene. Um, yeah, unfortunately he was drunk before he committed the crime. So I don't really know how to how to solve that one because you're really drunk. So you're going to be like, eh, just get this nappy and uh, it's, just, it's just like clean up the blood with that. <laughs> Little Spectre, you clown. <laughs> 
This would have been immediately evident at the scene, but Phil's hands were covered in gunpowder residue as well. Of course, the defense would bring up the fact that Lana's hands also had gunpowder residue on them, but that doesn't mean that she held the gun. The gun had been fired while inside Lana's mouth, and the type of revolver used creates roughly a three-foot cloud of gunpowder residue. If her hands had been on or above her lap when the bullet fired, they would have been generously dusted with residue regardless of who pulled the trigger. On the other hand, if Phil was an unsuspecting witness to a suicide who claimed to not have been that close to Lana when it happened, the residue shouldn't have gotten on his hands at all. That evidence wouldn't be known until later, but it didn't matter. Between the suspicious circumstances, the blood on Phil's jacket, his shoddy attempt to clean up the crime scene, and his monologue that randomly switched between being religious and apologetic, the police had seen enough. Phil was arrested on the spot for the murder of Lana Clarkson and brought to the station, where he went on the insane rant from the beginning of the episode during his initial interrogation. To the general public, this seemed unthinkable. In the wake of the O.J. Simpson trial, it was impossible to believe that authorities would try to hold a celebrity living in California responsible for their crimes. But when it came to the people that actually knew Phil, there wasn't a whole lot of surprise. Most of his friends and acquaintances heard the news of his arrest for murder and thought, yeah, that makes sense. If you've got friends who you wouldn't be surprised if they got arrested for fucking murder, maybe you should reevaluate that friendship because maybe you're the one that they will murder. Holy like, if, I cannot imagine this, any friend of mine. I've previously discussed, I think it was on another channel, there was a mate of mine. <laughs> one of our, one of our, like, when we were at school together, and uh, one of our mates' dads was always like, yeah, yeah. No, I could imagine him going to prison one day. And it's like, I don't see that as an impossibility. I mean, maybe less now, because we're all adults. But it's like, if anyone was like from that group of friends, it would be this dude. <laughs> but it's also not for murder. <laughs> It would be for something stupid. Should we call the cops? The day the arrest was made, the only person that seemed to speak out on his behalf was his ex-wife, Ronnie Spector. Ronnie claimed that she was baffled, hadn't slept all night because she was in such shock over the news. She admitted that, sure, he was an abusive and controlling husband, and she had divorced him after six years because she knew she had to get away from him. She even admitted that he had pulled a gun on her in the first few months after they got married. But to actually pull the trigger? That didn't sound like Phil to her. <laughs> yeah, the abusive husband, he pulled a gun on you. Yeah, he'd never pull the trigger, though, would he? That would be crazy. I mean, everyone has a gun pulled on them by their husbands occasionally. Right, Donnie? Ronnie, sorry, Ronnie, not Donny. Who cares? Then again, she may have just been trying to be polite. Ronnie had already written her 1990 autobiography in which she detailed the full extent of her abusive marriage, including how she signed away all of her music rights in the divorce settlement under threat of death. <laughs> yeah, he'd never pull the trigger, though, would he? So before the tragic murder of Lana Clarkson, who actually was Phil Spector, he's regarded as one of the most influential people in the history of pop music. He produced hit after hit with his famous wall of sound technique, yet no one who knew him seemed surprised to learn that he would... He he was a murderer. So what the hell happens in his life to lead up to this point? I'm gonna guess he's a massive bell end. Like we just he's a total <laughs> Because if someone's like if you're like, oh yeah, you could murder someone, they're gonna be a dickhead, aren't they? To know him is to hate him. Harvey Philip Spector was born on December the 26th, 1939 in the Bronx. He hated his first name, so he went by Phil instead. Phil faced a lot of abuse as a child. Some verbal abuse came from his mother, but most came from his classmates. He was a tiny child with big, protruding ears that would have made him an easy target for bullies. Being an asthmatic diabetic didn't help his cause either, nor did the fact that his family was poor. According to Phil, his classmates were all middle to upper class, so being poor just gave them one more reason to pick on him. Things only got harder for Phil when he was nine years old, and he saw his father commit suicide to escape his crippling debt. There are different recounts of exactly how this went down, with some saying Phil's father shot himself in front of the child, and others saying that Phil didn't witness the event but found the body. Either way, that would be a deeply traumatic event. A few years later, Phil's mother moved the family to Los Angeles. He was about ready to enter high school, and he was sick of being picked on. While he had probably hoped to have that huge teenage growth spurt that would leave him big enough to defend himself, it just never happened. Phil only grew to be five foot five, so he was going to need some help if he wanted to survive high school. His first plan was to learn to play guitar, something he always wanted to do anyway. Phil loved music and was obsessed with the status and respect that musicians had. Elvis had just become an international sensation, and Phil saw the way that men and women alike seemed to worship Elvis like he was some sort of god. That's exactly what Phil wanted for himself, and he was determined to make it happen. What do you want, Phil? I want to be worshipped like a god! Oh my god, that's alarming. But he wasn't famous yet! Though he had become friends with other aspiring musicians, as far as everyone else was concerned, he went from just being an unlikable little to an unlikable little with a guitar. That wasn't going to prevent him from being bullied, so he was going to need protection. 
Luckily for him, high school sports teams tend to have GPA requirements, requirements that many of the football players weren't able to meet on their own. Phil taught the football players how to get A's in certain classes, presumably by cheating, and in exchange, they'd act as his bodyguards. Smart. Hmm. Not only did having bodyguards keep him safe, it gave Phil his much-needed sense of control and superiority. These were the same people that used to torment him, but now they answered to him. It's kind of genius, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, this is like Phil seems like a bit of a dickhead, but you're like he's that's that's a big brain business move, isn't it? It's like that guy's gonna he's gonna he's gonna do something. Phil formed a band, the Teddy Bears, with some of his classmates, and following their graduation from high school, they auditioned for Era Records. Era signed them to record two to three singles, and if the songs did well, they get a larger deal. During this time, Phil was also mentored in sound production by Stan Ross, and he was a quick study. It didn't take long before he felt he could control the production of a song from start to finish. The Teddy Bears' first single. Don't You Worry My Little Pet didn't make any waves. This was the first song they recorded for their audition with Era, and while it didn't make them famous, it had gotten them valuable studio time. It was their second recording session that the Teddy Bears recorded the song To Know Him Is To Love Him. Phil had written their first single as well, but he was particularly obsessed with this song. The title came from the epitaph in his father's tombstone, and he was determined to make the recording perfect. By this point, he had veritable months of experience as Apprentice producer, so he took complete control over the production of the single. Two months after the single was released, it still hadn't been played once on the radio. Then it was suddenly on every radio. To Know Him Is To Love Him became an international hit, spending three weeks on the Billboard charts in America and hitting number two in the UK. Oh my god, this is a giant hit then. He attributed the song's success to the fact that he had controlled every aspect of its creation, including writing it, performing it, and producing it. <laughs> I want to be worshipped like a god. It's why is this song so good? Because I made it, of course. <laughs> and I guess there were a couple of other musicians involved, including the lead singer, but they weren't important. This was Phil's show, and he was the sole reason they'd sold over two million albums. That's double platinum, right? God damn. Ear assigned the band to record the 1959 album, The Teddy Bears Sing, but now they had a pop sensation on their hands and they weren't screwing around anymore. The original singles only cost Era $75 in studio time, so they weren't overly concerned if Phil wanted to take the reins on producing one of the signals singles. But now there was real money to be made, it was time for this punk ass kid to get out of the way and let industry professionals do their job producing the album. Now you'd think that this would have crushed Phil's ego, but it wound up doing the complete opposite. I'm sure he'd be pissed off at first, but when everything else the teddy bears recorded failed to chance, it just vindicated Phil's beliefs. And arguably quite fairly. Musicians are so selfish. He was the best and most capable person in the music industry, and the only reason their new songs weren't selling is because Era hadn't let him produce them. The band was dropped by Era after failing to chart again, and Phil briefly formed another band that didn't go anywhere either, but he wasn't really interested in performing anymore. His true calling was as a producer, and he knew that he was going to revolutionize the industry, and it seems like he it actually goes on to do that, doesn't he? He's like, his narcissism was correct in this case. Phil had met a promoter named Lester Sills when he was still in the Teddy Bears, and Lester hooked him up with an apprenticeship in New York, working for the songwriting and production duo Jerry Leiber and Mike Stoller. He co-wrote some songs and did session work as well, playing the guitar solo in the hit song on Broadway. By 1961, Phil was ready to set out on his own, so he and Lester Sills co-founded the record label Phyllis Records, a portmanteau of their first names. After courting multiple artists, they signed their first group in Late 1961, The Crystals. The Crystals had multiple hits, reaching as high as number 10 on the Billboard Top 100, but they weren't quite able to make it to number one. Yeah, but hits as high as number 10 on the Top 100 is still bloody high. That's still unbelievably successful compared to most bands which never do anything. The following year, Lester left Fellas Records and Phil took a job as a producer at Liberty Records. If you think that sounds like a giant conflict of interest, um, wait, why, why would it be? Because Lester left Fellas Records and Phil took a job as a producer at Liberty Records. Well, didn't they just go their separate ways? What am I missing? But you'd be absolutely right. In his brief time at Liberty, Phil heard the song He's a Rebel, written by Gene Pitney and recorded by Vicky Carr. Simon, I know you haven't recognized a single name you've said so far for the past 20 minutes other than Elvis, but I promise you they were all extremely famous. Yeah, I have no idea who these people are. Anyway, Phil rushed back to his studio and had Darlene Love and the Blossoms record a cover of He's a Rebel to be released before Vicky Carr's version. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. He's got his own production company and then he's going to work at another production company and he's stealing 
their song. Uh Uh-oh, that sounds illegal. Not just like a conflict of interest, that sounds illegal. The song was attributed to the Crystals because that's just the way the Blossoms were treated and it quickly rose to number one. It would be his second of many top hits, but 1963 is the year things really took off when he reproduced Bob B. Socks and the Blue Jeans cover of Zippity Doodah, the famous track from Disney's infamous Song of the South. Yeah, now I remember that Zippity Doodah song. That was mega famous when I was a kid. And then as an adult, I found out this from a racist movie. (laughs) Oh, the past. It was with this album that Phil first fully implemented his signature wall of sound recording technique. The wall of sound was a revolutionary idea, the likes of which the music industry had never seen before. It created a much bigger and fuller sound. It was a true testament to the brilliance of... Was the orchestra. That's it. That's the whole technique. The only reason the Wall of Sound was considered groundbreaking was because pop music from the 1950s and 40s had been so painfully shallow and vapid. As the Beach Boys Brian Wilson put it, in the 40s and 50s, arrangements were considered, okay, here, listen to that French horn or listen to the string section now. It was all a definite sound. There weren't combinations of sound. So that was Phil's incredible idea. Multiple instruments at the same time. And again, Kevin is making fun of this. But no one had done it so far. So, like, Phil Spector seems like a terrible person who killed someone, but this seems like a pretty fucking genius idea. Like, it's entirely possible to separate people from their art. I think, or can it be? Should it be? I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's really not. And that's why people get cancelled and stuff. But look, in this case, this was a really clever idea that he did. He did it first. Sometimes he even played the same part on similar instruments like a piano, electric guitar, and a harpsichord and blended them together to sound like a single instrument. You know, the sort of thing that ensemble musicians are generally trying to do when they perform live anyway. Yeah, but he did it first. It's a fact. I looked it up once. Composers had this shit figured out centuries ago, and it hurts my soul that this was Phil's big innovation that let him get away with so much bullshit throughout his career. Sure, he fine-tuned the recordings to sound good coming out of a radio or duke box, but producers should have been doing that anyway. Kevin, Kevin, this is... like, Look, I don't know this full story, but just from what you've told me, he did it first. I'd rather it be a nice person who came up with this, but Phil Spector came up with this. That same year, Phil married his first wife, Annette Marat. Annette had been the lead singer of the Spectres 3, the short-lived band that succeeded the Teddy Bears. Their marriage would only last three years, in no small part, to Phil's affair with Ronnie Bennett, the co-founder and lead singer of the Renettes. The Renettes signed with Philly's Records in 1963, and Ronnie was instantly attracted to Phil. Despite being a newlywed, Phil began the affair as soon as the Renettes were signed. Anybody who has read this story before could probably tell you that Ronnie was 17 years old to Phil's 24 when this affair began, though this isn't actually true. I haven't been able to find where that story originated or why it's so widespread, but Phil was only four years older than Ronnie. There's already plenty of stuff wrong with both their relationship and with Phil as a person, so there's no need to try and make him look even worse with misinformation. I mean, seven. To, I get that in America there's that there's that line of like 18, right? And is there in the UK? I feel like America is very strict about this. Like, but then what happens if you're 18 and your girlfriend's 17? You could be in the same school year, and that's not okay. Surely that's okay. Look, 24 is a bit. What's that? What's that? Is it? Is it half your age plus seven? 12 plus seven, 19. So, oh, okay. So no, it's not okay. It needs to be slightly older. Yeah, it is a bit weird, but it's not like he's 50 or something. I shouldn't be defending him, should I? <laughs> it's not a good look. In the short time the Renettes were active, they became a huge success. They had half a dozen top 40 hits with their hit, Be My Baby peaking at number two. When they toured the UK, their opening act was the Rolling Stones. When the Beatles toured the US in 1966, the Renettes were their opening act, becoming the only girl group to tour with the Beatles. They broke up in 1967, and in 1968, Ronnie Burnett became Ronnie Spector. I've heard of the Ronettes, and I've definitely heard of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones. Like, I I know the Rolling Stones, listened to the Rolling Stones before. Lately, I, I just started listening to the Rolling Stones more. And just like, their greatest hits... It's like every single one of those songs I know and is a banger. It's like I went for a run the other day. I was just listening to like the top Rolling Stones songs on Spotify, not being like super familiar with the Rolling Stones. It's like I know all of these songs, all of these songs. Well, they're all good. You got a famous evening in Cuba. And for the first year or so, they were happily married. There was one time Phil pulled a gun on her, but Phil was already known for pulling guns on people. The two adopted a child together, and at first it seemed like they were going to be the perfect celebrity couple, but after the honeymoon phase was over, 
things got real bad real fast. Ah, yes, the honeymoon phase where he pulled the gun at her once. Roddy was very literally a prisoner in her own home. They erected a chain link fence around his mansion, which he then covered in barbed wire, and he purchased a number of guard dogs. He would steal and hide Ronnie's shoes so that she couldn't try and run away, and she was never allowed to leave the house. What the f- there were at least five servants on staff, so if she wanted anything, Phil would send them instead. The only time Ronnie was allowed to leave Phil's castle was once per month to buy feminine products, but if she took more than 20 minutes, he would send bodyguards to go and retrieve her. Oh yes, and when she did leave the house, she had to have a life-size dummy of Phil in the passenger seat. This is and weird. Also, why do you get to why do you get to decide what she does, Phil? You douchebag. Eventually, Phil started to realize that his wife was unhappy and that she might eventually make a run for it with or without shoes. But Phil had an ace up his sleeve. Having grown up in the 40s and 50s, he knew that there was one surefire way to trap a woman in a loveless marriage. The couple returned to their mansion on Christmas Day, 1969. Though it's unclear where they'd been. Let's just say it was Christmas mass. Anyway, as the car pulled in, Ronnie saw her Christmas present running in circles around the fountain. You know. You know those car commercials where the sociopathic husband buys his wife a $60,000 SUV with a giant bow on it for Christmas as if that's a normal purchase for middle class people to make without discussing it with their spouse first? <laughs> it's fucking true, isn't it? Just like those cars with the bow. It's like you bought, oh God, what's the payments on this? How much are we going to be out for month? Can we afford this? Are you insane? A new car? <laughs> I, I've never bought a new car. Um, all my cars I bought slightly u- slightly used because I'm like I, I'm not I'm not the sucker who's gonna like get that car but the first mile on it instantly lose like twenty percent of the value. Are you insane? People are like, oh well, don't you like the smell of a fresh new used car, uh, of a new car? And I'm like, yeah, but not that much. And also like don't don't they, don't you want to choose the interior color and stuff? And it's like not that much, not that much. No, I'd rather get thirty percent more car. To be honest, like maybe I'll spend the same amount of money on a car, but I'll get a 30% better car that's just two years old. I don't know. Like, I'm not into new cars. Now imagine one of those commercials, but replace the new car with brand new twin sons. What the f? I assumed it was a dog. Dude, that was Ronnie's surprise Christmas present and Phil's plan to keep her trapped in the house forever. That's fed up, Phil you douchebag. But he was still worried that she might have some reservations, perhaps springing a surprise double adoption on Ronnie may not have won her over in the way he hoped, so he devised a new plan. He had a large golden coffin with a glass lid installed in the basement. Whenever he was worried that Ronnie might try to run, he reminded her that if she tried to leave, he'd kill her and put her corpse on display inside the coffin for all of his guests. Phil, what the fuck is going on in your head? You're absolutely mad. In 1972, about four years into their marriage, Ronnie's mother came to visit. She was horrified with everything she saw and stayed up for three days and three nights planning an escape. It wasn't an amazing plan, but it was a plan. Ronnie broke a window and ran out without any of her belongings, not even her shoes. Also, despite her comments to the press following Phil's 2003 arrest during the divorce proceedings, she testified to the fact that he didn't only pull a gun on her once. He did it all the time, including after she escaped the house. Phil allegedly threatened to hire a hitman to kill her if she didn't sign over all of her future earnings from the records he produced, and he allegedly pulled a gun on her and threatened to kill her if she didn't give him custody of their children. Oh my f-ing god, Phil, you're mental. That wasn't just the kind of man Phil was in private either. He had acted like this all the time. Like I said, he was known for putting guns on people, what they casually referred to as gunplay, as if that's a totally normal thing. They even claimed that he would color coordinate his guns to match his outfits. It was not only how he handled his personal life, but his professional life as well. Now, I'm not going to go over Phil's entire music career. He produced so many number one hits that it would take forever. And frankly, he's a piece of sh- so I'd just rather not. But there are a couple of stories that I want to go over to highlight just how volatile his personality was and how well known that fact was to everyone who met him. Phil was notoriously difficult to work with, even in his early career. He was an obsessive, controlling perfectionist that was miserable to be around and everybody knew it. Why am I not surprised? You can even find lists online with things like the top five singers Phil Spector pulled a gun on. <laughs> Seriously? Ah! Oh my god, how's this guy not in prison? But they couldn't argue with the results, so the top recording artists sought him out even despite his reputation. One such group, and one that finally Simon's finally heard of, was the Beatles. After doing production work on John Lennon's solo in Instant Karma, Phil was brought to the UK to let turn Let It Be into an album. At this point, the Beatles were on the verge of breaking up, and Let It Be was just an abandoned pile of tapes recorded by four guys that didn't want to be there. But Lennon and George Harrison thought that Phil could turn it into something usable. He did. But first he had to terrorize Lennon a bit. Phil reportedly chased Lennon through the studio halls with a gun. As a British person, Lennon was be like, what the f***? 
Oh, I'm ready to get a gun! At one point, he even allegedly pulled a gun at Lenin near point blank range and fired at the thermostat on the wall. The gun was almost right next to Lenin's ear, and after the shot was fired, he said something to the effect of, If you're going to kill me, that's fine, but if not, I'll need my hearing. That seems like a very British response to a very American action. It does, doesn't it? It doesn't really sound like Phil was the type of person that anyone would want to associate with. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does, Kevin, because he's a douchebag, but he obviously gets mega results. So I'd be like, look, if there was some like Phil Spectre of YouTube, I'd be like, hello, Phil. Tell me what I'm doing wrong, Phil. Tell me, pet. I'll pay you, Phil. Come on, I need you, Phil. And he'd be like pulling a gun on me and I'd be like, yeah, but he gets those results. I got those million view videos. Oh, I have to hang out with Phil. He's such a dickhead, but he's so clever. Simon, are you all right? But Let It Be went to number one in both the US and the UK, so the next year Lennon hired him again to produce his solo album Imagine. Lennon could call himself a communist all he wants, but it sure sounds like he loved making money. In 1974, Phil was in a serious car crash. His body was flung through the windshield, and he received massive head trauma, requiring hours of surgery and 700 stitches, 300 on his face, and 400 on the back of his head. Now, I had six stitches. Five, six, four. I had a bunch of stitches on the back of my head. I cracked my head open when I was a kid. Um, kid, I was like 18, 19. And I used to have this little scar on the back of my head. And I cut it open when I shave my head sometimes. And it's like, yeah, it's a little bit bumpy. And so it's like, ah, like this scar. His face must be covered in scars. Oh, my Lord. Phil had always been paranoid and reclusive, but following the accident, he withdrew from society even more. It's quite probable that the head injury had only made him more insane and unpredictable. One of the last albums he worked on was The Ramones' End of the Century, which was recorded at Phil's mansion. In interviews from the early 80s following the album's release, the Ramones were quite candid about what a hostile environment it was. They said that they were literally kept hostage at the mansion for days at a time, being threatened with a gun every time they tried to leave. The in-studio experience was miserable for them as well. Johnny Ramone explained that they played the first chord of Rock and Roll High School and Phil just listened to it in the studio for 12 hours. He also described having to repeat the part hundreds of times for hours on end, an experience he speculated must what must be what Chinese water torture is like. Yeah, but you're still like, yeah, but it's Phil Spector. He's gonna listen to it for 12 hours. That's why he's Phil Spector. That's why he's so good. Yeah. It's like this guy's like unquestionably a musical genius. Like he's making these incredible albums. There was nothing rock or punk about the way that Phil wanted to intensely labor over every note, and the Ramones seemed to genuinely hate everything about the experience. Yeah, but you're like, he's gonna make us number one. He's gonna make us the Ramones, who I've heard of! It's not surprising that they would hate being held hostage at gunpoint, but what was surprising was how vocal they were about it. Everyone in the industry knew what a lunatic Phil was, but they were from a more dignified era when people didn't talk about such things publicly. Then all these damn punk musicians came along and started talking in interviews about all the behind-the-scenes stuff that was supposed to be kept secret. First you had Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols calling out Jimmy Savile in 78, and now the Ramones were going after Phil Spector. I mean, when was it going to end? Of course, despite the fact that they'd absolutely nothing Nothing positive and quite a bit negative to say about Phil, End of the Century was the Ramones' highest charting and most commercially successful album ever. I guess you're right all along, huh? Then again, their dedicated fans hated it for sounding like overpolished pop music designed for radio. Yes, but it was their most successful album ever ever. Shortly after that album, Phil's career went almost entirely dormant. He would take on the occasional project, but mostly just hung around stockpiling ridiculous wigs that he could wear to cover all of the scars on his head from the accident. Though since he wasn't working, he had plenty of time in 1994 to write a letter to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominating committee to prevent the Ronettes, and more specifically his ex-wife, from being considered for induction, because he was not only a gun-wielding maniac, but he was apparently also a petty little bitch. And that brings us to 2003 and the events that took place following his visit to the House of Blues. The Trials After his initial arrest, Phil was released on $1 million bail, and it would be over four years before the trial finally began. During this time, he would go through three different sets of lawyers. His first was Robert Shapiro, part of O.J. Simpson's dream team of defense lawyers. I said he should have got O.J.'s guys. Shapiro was present for some of the early pre-trial hearings and secured Phil's release on bail, but he was quickly fired. When the trial finally began in 2007, Phil's lead defense attorney was Bruce Cutler, who was best known for defending famed mob boss John Gotti. There were a couple of really important decisions made by the judge before the trial began. The first was that the trial would be televised because this 
just how we roll in America. But more importantly, the judge ruled that he would allow testimony not only from Phil's ex-wives, but also from four other women that he pulled guns on. Normally, a person's past misdeeds can't be used against them as evidence of a current alleged misdeed. Even prior convictions are supposed to be off the table. However, these four women all had the exact same story as each other, and it was very similar to Lana's story. Each of the other women, all of whom Phil had been romantically interested in, went drinking with him. When they went back to his mansion, they rejected his advances, and he pulled a gun on them to prevent them from leaving. Phil's intended defense was that Lana accidentally committed suicide. It's like, whoops, a daisy? He said she was playing with the gun and, in his words, kissed the gun and either it misfired or she accidentally pulled the trigger. But the testimony from the other witnesses would show that Phil was trying to coerce Lana the same way that he tried to coerce all the other women that weren't interested in him, and the judge decided it can be used to show lack of accident or mistake. Even if firing the gun was an accident, there would be almost no way Phil's defense team could argue that he didn't intentionally point the gun directly at her face, as he had done so many times before to so many others. The trial lasted for six months, and the prosecution presented the evidence we discussed earlier, as well as additional testimony from the other women Phil appointed guns at and from his ex-wives. So when he was muttering to his, himself, right, he was saying it was a mistake. And like, I, I'm inclined to believe that he didn't mean to shoot her. But you point a gun at someone, you know that it can potentially fire someone, kill someone, and then you accidentally shoot them. Uh, even if you didn't quite have the intent to kill, you could have foreseen, at least in the UK, I believe it would work, you would foresee the possible possibility of grievous bodily harm. And that would mean the mens rea, the mental aspect of the crime, would be there, if I remember this from school 10 years ago. Right? So in the UK, I think he'd still be guilty of murder. And I get that feeling that that's what's going to happen here. Five months into the trial, Bruce Cutler quit the case, citing a difference of opinion with Phil over their defense strategy. That's not a great sign for the defense. And his associate attorney had to take over as lead for the closing arguments. The forensic details regarding the blood spatter and such were a bit more technical and detailed than I got into. But based on the evidence presented, I hope I haven't left you with any reasonable doubt. The defense tried to paint Lana as a depressed, failed actress who couldn't pay her rent and would sleep with anyone she could have if she thought it could help her career. There wasn't really evidence to support this other than a couple of emails she had written to friends, but it was nothing that would reasonably support suicide. It was just a typical venting about work and finances that happens between friends sometimes. To both the prosecution and the viewers at home, the case seemed open and shut. The evidence of Phil's guilt was overwhelming, and to call the defense flimsy would be giving it too much credit. And because this is America, I can tell you exactly how the deliberate deliberation process went for the jurors. Because again, that's just how we roll here. Yeah, in the UK, you can't. It's like that's what happens with the jury is completely private. Not even the jury can speak about it. It's like they're forbidden. In an interview, one of the jurors for the trial explained exactly what happened. He showed up for deliberation, fully expecting everyone to agree that Phil was guilty. He figured they'd hang out for a couple of hours so they could get their free lunch, and then they'd return the verdict of guilty and go home. But as soon as deliberations began, he asked the foreman if they could do a quick poll and to see where everybody stood. The vote stood as four guilty, five not guilty, and three undecided. Wow. Apparently not everybody agreed that it was an open and shut case, and the jury spent 12 days deliberating. After those 12 days, the final vote stood at 10 guilty and 2 not guilty. They were completely deadlocked, and nothing was going to get them to agree. Isn't that enough to be, like, not guilty? It's just like, oh, what was that? There was an amazing scene. Ah, oh, it's at the end of um, Better Call Saul, when Saul is, like, talking to... Oh, I'm not going to spoil it, because it's so recent, but it's a fucking absolutely golden line where he's just like, I just need one. Jura. And it's like, oh, God, that was brilliant writing. Although there were two not guilty votes, the blame for the deadlock was placed entirely on a single juror. In a criminal case, it is the burden of the prosecution to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. However, in this juror's mind, they had to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. The jurors would go over the evidence with him and explain the only scenario that made sense. He would come back with, yes, but this and this could have happened. We just don't know. They tried to explain that his scenarios were very technically possible, but they were not even remotely reasonable. But there was absolutely nothing short of video evidence of the murder that this particular juror would have found satisfactory to meet the beyond a reasonable doubt threshold. So they eventually gave up. With the jury deadlocked, a mistrial was declared, and they had to start all over again. But the prosecution wasn't concerned. They were obviously annoyed, but they knew why the deadlock had happened and had no reason to believe that it would happen again. As long as they could make sure to disqualify any needlessly nitpicky douchebags during jury selection, they believed that they would be fine. They were correct. 
And after an unnecessarily long 19 days of deliberations, the jury in the second trial found Phil Spector guilty of murder in the second degree and of using a firearm in the commission of a crime. He was sentenced to 19 years to life in California State Prison. Okay, so second degree murder, because I don't believe that he intended to actually kill her. He may have been found guilty by a jury of his peers, but deep in their hearts, Phil Spector's lawyers knew that they could keep sending him invoices for massive amounts of billable hours if they kept filing pointless appeals and motions. In 2011, Phil's conviction was upheld on appeal. His request for a second appeal hearing was denied, and the state Supreme Court declined to review that decision. But his lawyers weren't done. They were going to take this all the way to the United States Supreme Court if their client would pay for it. SCOTUS denied the petition for them to review the case, as did the Federal District Court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Phil's attorneys continued filing motions for appeal until at least 2015, by which point it just feels like a form of legal robbery. <laughs> Phil would have been eligible for parole next year, but he died in prison on January the 16th, 2021, due to COVID. Oh, I remember him dying of COVID. Yeah. Oh, no. Phil Spector was a tiny little man, both literally and figuratively. Despite being lauded for his creative genius, he was a weak and fragile narcissist who had to control everyone and everything around him the only way he knew how. Though he was only ever charged with one murder, there's no telling the depth of the emotional trauma he caused to those around him. Many of the musicians he worked with may have been able to justify it as gunplay and just Phil being Phil, but the women he took out for drinks could never have suspected their nights would end being held prisoners at gunpoint. And of course, there was his second wife, Ronnie, who met him before his affinity for brandishing guns in public had developed. There was no way for her to suspect the years of abuse and trauma that she would suffer at his hands. Lana Clarkson was a kind, intelligent, and talented performer whose only crime was being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Had she not been working on that night in particular, we can only guess where her career might have gone. Maybe her career in show business had reached its end, or maybe she was going to become the next Joan Rivers. Well, unfortunately, never know. But this whole story highlights that we as a society need to be less forgiving of so-called eccentricities among celebrities just because they are considered geniuses in their field. Nobody should get a free pass for violent crimes just because of their wealth and status. It also shows that perhaps we should actually listen to those punk kids once in a while. You don't have to like their music or their anarchist messages, but when they start making allegations like this guy's a serial diddler or this guy held a sausage for days at gunpoint, it's probably worth looking into. Yeah, the Jimmy Savile thing there, the reference to that is mental. Jimmy Savile. Like, that went on for decades, and everyone knew it. Or well, like, all these famous people knew it, and nothing ever happened. Crazy. That's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs>